Today we are meeting on Luttrawitta, Aboriginal land, sea and waterways. We acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land, the Muanina people on which we meet today. The Muanina people belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. They cared and protected for country for thousands of years. They knew this land, they lived on the land, and they died on these lands. The Muanina people, for the Muanina people, the area around Nipaluna was their country, and they called Mount Wellington Kunyani. We acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and walk in the footsteps of those before us, beneath the mountain, among the gums and waterways that continue to run through the veins of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status and to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continues to care for country. We recognise a history of truth which acknowledges the impacts of invasion and colonisation upon Aboriginal people resulting in the forcible removal from their lands. Our island is deeply unique with spectacular landscapes, with our cities and towns surrounded by bushland, wilderness, mountain ranges and beaches. We stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights paving the way for a stronger future. Welcome to the 2021 Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture. I'd like to ex extend a special welcome to Frances Underwood, who is here with us today, and her family, as well as a number of other visitors, and our special guests, Auntie Patsy Cameron and Professor Tim McCormick. This event is held biannually to commem commemorate the life, values and achievements of the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and Governor of Tasmania, Peter Underwood. Peter had a strong connection with the school for many years. He served as presiding member of the Board of Governors in the 1990s, and in his time on the board, he guided the school through a difficult period including the fundraising and rebuilding of facilities which were considered unsafe for occupation. His wife, Frances, taught at the Friends School for 24 years, including 14 as the head of Morris Primary Years. Most of their children attended the school and his legacy has continued today through their current descendants at the school. Peter's mantra was that we must actively strive for peace and justice on a daily basis, which was a statement that captured his highly developed social conscience. Peter used his platform as governor of Tasmania to advocate for indigenous issues such as land rights and education. The establishment of the Peter Underwood Centre after his death focuses on research, partnerships and initiatives that contribute to positive and sustained change for all Tasmanians. He was a passionate believer in the transformative power of education to achieve this aim. While Peter wasn't a practising Quaker, his life work embraced many of the Quaker values, in particular peace, justice, service and education. In 2015, the Friends School hosted the first lecture as a way of honouring Peter's life. I'd like to now invite to the stage our head boy and head girl, Riley Curtin and Aaliyah Walker, to introduce our guest speakers for today's lecture. Today we are honoured to welcome our special guests, Auntie Patsy Cameron and Professor Tim McCormack to present the fourth Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture. Dr Patsy Cameron is an Aboriginal elder who has spent more than 40 years working to improve access to education for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Dr Cameron has a Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in Archaeology and Geography and a Master of Art in the Tasmanian Aboriginal History. She was the first Tasmanian to be appointed to the landmark National Aboriginal Edu Education Committee, helped establish the Aboriginal Studies course at the University of Tasmania, and worked at Rio Wuna Centre for Aboriginal Education. 
Her passions include promoting and preserving Aboriginal heritage through her work with the community and museums. In 2017, Dr Cameron was recognised for her decades of community service by being named an Officer of the Order of Australia. Tim McCormack is a Professor of International Law and the former Dean of the University of Tasmania's Law School. He's a Special Advisor on War Crimes to the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague and is also undertaking the undertaking an inquiry for the Tasmania Department of Education into the problem of sexual abuse of students in Tasmanian government schools. Tim has developed an international reputation for his expertise in international humanitarian law and international criminal law, and in 2015 and 2016, was a Fulbright Senior Scholar with the positions of Charles H. Stockton, Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the US Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and also as a James Barr Ames Visiting Professor at Harvard Law School. Tim has won a number of prestigious awards for his publications, supervision of PhD students, teaching and public advocacy. Tim grew up in Burnie and studied law at UTAS in Hobart. This lecture marks an important step in our friendly conference journey in which we, as a community, explore the idea of reconciliation with Australia's Indigenous community. This theme aligns with the school's strate strategic priority of producing a reconciliation action plan and our work with the Tasmanian Reconciliation Collective. We are placing an emphasis on understanding what it means to contribute to reconciliation and how as a school we can strengthen and put into practice what is stated in our acknowledgement of country. We believe that peace and justice are key elements to reconciliation. Auntie Patsy and Tim's knowledge and experience will provide a great insight into this issue. Please join me in welcoming Auntie Patsy and Tim to the Friends School. Thank you. Today I acknowledge four resistant fighters for their bravery defending their lands, peoples and ancient cultural traditions from the British invaders. I also acknowledge the courageous resolutions they reached to negotiate peace with the Van Diemen's Land government in 1831 and the astronomical cost to their life world that were associated with those decisions. Through my mother's line, I trace my Indigenous heritage to two of these great leaders and formidable warriors of the colonial times, Manalagina of the Northeast Coastal Plains Nation and Tongalongta of the East Coast Oyster Bay Nation. Manalagina and Tongalongta, along with Multihilagina of the North and Midlands Stony Creek Nation and Montpelliata of the Central Plateau Big River Nation are at the heart of this historic na historical narrative that will explain the circumstances of a colonial treaty made in Van Diemen's Land in 1831. Truth telling and listening to the voices of our ancestors are pivotal to this presentation that seeks to acknowledge one of the most significant episodes of history albeit 190 years after a verbal treaty was sanctioned. The purpose of this uh, presentation is to highlight the promises made during colonial times to enable you, the next generation of leaders, to gain an understanding of one of the most profound historic injustices that remain unresolved and ignored today. Indeed, there is a conspiracy of silence that envelops the 1831 treaties. The Aboriginal population at the time of the British invasion in 1803 is unknown because no one bothered to count them as cultural beings. The first people were considered savages, part of the fauna and flora. There are, however, speculative figures proposed for the original population um, Henry Melville estimated 20,000, David Davis est claimed 15,000, Clive Lord uh, 10 to 12,000, James Calder 6,000 to 8,000, uh, more recently Brian Plomley 4,000 to 6,000 and now um, Professor Henry Reynolds 5,000 to 7,000. There are other figures that range from 1,000 to as low as 660, which are, for obvious reasons, contested. 
What we do know is that when Flinders Island Aboriginal establishment was abandoned in 1847, several hundred ancestors were interred far from their homelands in the Wybalena burial ground, and only 47 survivors, that is 15 men, 22 women, five boys and five girls were transferred to a condemned penal station, a place that was unfit for convicts at the Oyster Cove, uh, at Oyster Cove south of Hobart. The rapid decline in population was primarily the result of acts of massacre and war that continued unabated throughout the 1820s. During this time, lethal conflict between the colonists and the Aboriginal clans intensified across the land frontier. Clive Lord, a man of science and a former director of TMAG, was told that in 1825-26, 2,000 Aborigines were killed on the land frontier. This figure is unsubstantiated, of course. However, Lord remained convinced by his source, and it was recorded as such. There were others who voiced grave concerns about the impacts of the frontier conflict on Aboriginal people. In December 1827, William Walk of Bredorban, a property south of Launceston, wrote to the Lieutenant Governor Arthur's office with a suggestion that a treaty might be negotiated with the Aborigines of Van Diemen's Land. But these voices were discarded at the time. The following year, martial law was declared on Van, in Van Diemen's Land. The outcome of martial law provided a legal catalyst for the colony to commit systematic acts of genocide against Aboriginal people who could now be legally shot on sight. To appease the colonists, some of whom were calling for total extermination of the savages, Lieutenant Governor Arthur proclaimed two campaigns to be undertaken simultaneously. The first was a military operation that would commence in October 1830, where several thousand soldiers and colonists would be deployed to drive the Aborigines trapped ahead of the advancing lines into the Tasman Peninsula, where they would be captured alongside, where they'd be captured. Alongside this military operation, armed bounty hunters, so often referred to as roving parties, continued to be dispatched into the surrounding bush to hunt Aborigines. Both operations had the effect of dispersing Aboriginal people away from their homelands, and they were forced to seek safe haven in remote neighbouring nation lands. A second campaign was Arthur's commission of George Augustus Robinson and a group of Aboriginal guides who were to circle the island and negotiate with the clans who were still free in the bush to place themselves under Robinson's protection. Robinson's treks between 1829 and 1835 were recorded paradoxically as the friendly missions. On the 1st of November 1830, my ancestral grandfather Manalagina was among a small confederated group located by Robinson's guides inland from the Bay of Fires on the East Coast. Through his guides, Robinson communicated his purpose to the group. Using a stick to draw many lines on the ground, he explained the military operation that was underway to the south. Robinson's insistence that they were in grave danger must have startled the people, for when a loud noise was heard in the distance, he amplified their fears by agreeing with them that it was musket fire. He claimed that the soldiers were coming to shoot them, even though he knew the line operations were moving southward through the Midlands and the Thingol Valley. The group of five men, including Manalagena and two women, agreed to place themselves under Robinson's protection on that day, and they became the first in Van Diemen's land to be banished from their homelands. This first exodus was nine months before a treaty was articulated by Robinson. It's worthy to note that the idea of a treaty with the First Nation people was being considered by some officials at the time. In February 1831, Chief Justice Pedder, in a speech to the Executive Council, 
presented treaty as an alternative to the Aborigines being banished from their homelands. However, by this time, Robinson had already ascertained the suitability of Swan Island as a place of exile for his small group, and treaty was certainly not on his mind. In early 1831, the Aboriginal establishment was relocated from Swan Island to Gun Carriage Island, that's located between Flinders and Cape Barren Islands. Here, Manalagena and his young wife, Tan Labonia, were assigned one of the nine cottages on the island. But hope turned, soon hope turned to despair when several deaths were recorded within a few weeks of their arrival on gun carriage. It was several months later that Robinson sent a boat to Gun Carriage Island to collect Manalagena, who Robinson knew was the only person who could make physical contact with another group, Multihilagena's group, um, who Robinson had been searching for in the northeast bush for several months. On the 6th of, October, of August 1831, Manalagena was greeted by Robinson as he stepped ashore at Little Musaro Bay. The content of this meeting was recorded in Robinson's journal. This morning I developed my plans to the Chief Manalagena and explained to him the benevolent views of the government towards himself and people. He cordially acquiesced and expressed his entire approbation of the salutary measure and promised his utmost bid, aid and assistance. I informed him in the presence of Kikatapola that I was commissioned by the governor to inform them that if the natives would desist from their wanted outrages upon the whites, they would be allowed to remain in their respective districts and would have flour, tea and sugar, clothes, etc., given them, that a good white man would dwell with them, who would take care of them and would, allow, would not allow any bad white men to shoot them. And he would go with them about the bush like myself and they could hunt. He, Manalagena, was delighted. Robinson accounted in his diary uh, the de these details. This promise made at Little Mossoro Bay, the terms of which were agreed by both parties, Robinson as Lieutenant Governor Arthur's representative and Manalagena as the revered clan leader of the North East. Of significance here is that Robinson noted the promise was witnessed by one of his guides, Kicker to Polar, who was known to Governor, o Lieutenant Governor Arthur, and he could speak English very well. For it acknowledged that this formal process of Western, was a formal protest of pro, process of Western law that required a witness to such an agreement. Robinson reiterated the terms of the agreement to Manalagena again on the 27th of August, 1831, saying, I omit no opportunity of impressing upon the mind of the chief and others that they are to remain in their own country and that I am anxious to get to them for the purpose of going to others and that I will leave a man to take care of them and that some of the Tyra law women shall stay with them. At this arrangement they were much pleased and say it is very good indeed. Multihiligena Sorry, when Manalagena successfully made contact with Multihilagena and brought his group to meet Robinson at Little Pipers River on the 29th of August 1831, Robinson again reiterated the views of the government. I have made known to them the wish of the government that if they would not spear white men and they might, that they might remain and hunt and they seemed glad and lifted their hands and said no, no, no. Soon after securing Multihila Guinness Group, Robinson moved out of the northeast to search for other small groups in the bush. All the while, he continued to induce his guides, now including Manalagena, by reinforcing the agreements made at Little Musaro Bay and Little Pipers River. He said, I admit no opportunity of impressing upon the mind of the chief and other natives that they are to remain in their own country and repeating to them the benevolent uh, intentions of the government towards the native tribes. 
Robinson made sure that it would not abscond and he threatened a warrior from Port Surreal that if he went away, the soldiers would shoot him. On the 31st of December 1831, after travelling through rugged country on the Central Plateau, Robinson met with a group of 16 men, nine women and a child near Lake Echo. They included two powerful and formidable warriors, Tongalongta of the Oyster Bay Nation and Montpelliata of the Big River Nation. This group of 26 people were believed to be all that remained of two great nations that once numbered several, several thousand. Robinson recorded the following. They were willing to accept the office of the government and place themselves under my protection accordingly. And added in a note to the colonial secretary, these people cannot and ought not be looked upon as captives. They have placed themselves under my protection and are desirous for peace. These two formidable warriors, Tongalongta and Montpelliata, had agreed to a truce on the basis of Robinson's promise. Robinson, his Aboriginal guides and the Big River and Oyster Bay people arrived in Hobart Town on the 7th of January, 1832. Holding spears in their hand, hands and accompanied by 100 dogs, they walked to Government House and met the governor as equals. John Glover's sketch depicts the group waiting for a boat to transport them to Flinders Island to Waibalena. Montpelliata can be seen sitting with a group at the top, second on the right. They were taken to Waibalena on Flinders Island and would never touch their homelands again. In 1834, the Commandant of Waibalena, Henry Nichols, wrote, the basic problem is quite clear. The Aborigines have been induced to leave their native land by a promise that all their wants would be supplied and they expected this undertaking to be honoured. They were eager to learn to write, not to become scholars like white men, but to be able to write to their governor father in Hobart Town, as they are anxious to induce him to remove them to their native land. They would be perfectly wretched were they certain they should die there at Waibalena. When Robinson's missions were completed on the mainland, he took up a new position as Commandant at Waibalena. It was late 1835. By this time, Manal again realised that the Little, Bay, Little Musselrow Bay Agreement would never be honoured. He knew that he was tricked into leaving his homelands. He knew he would never walk in the footprints of his ancestors or see his own country again. When he arrived at Flinders Island, Manalagena cut off his significant physical representations of his esteemed warriorship and leadership status, his ochred hair and his beard. And he died on December the 4th, 1835, a month after his return into exile. Maltheel again died in Launceston in mid-1832. Montpelliata, who was renamed Waterloo by Robinson, died at Waibalena in mid-1835. And Tongalongta, renamed King William by Robinson, died at Waibalena in June 1837. According to Lyndall Ryan, death and despair at Waibalena was the price for surviving the wars with the settlers by incarceration in a place far from their homeland. As time passed, the exiles at Waibalena refused to work for their rations and to grow crops, stating that the king will keep them. White men work, not them. According to Lyndall, according to Lyndall Ryan, they considered their rations as bare compensation for the loss of their land. All the while, the people at Waibalena waited for news of their return to their respective homelands, for they did not forget the agreements made by Robinson in the bush. They despised the commandant, Dr. Jeanneret, for inflicting spiteful and inhumane punishment against them. And when rumours circulated in 1846 that Jeanneret was returning as commandant, the people took action first by complaining in writing to the governor, John Franklin, 
Then in February 1846, they petitioned Queen Victoria. The petition stated in part, the humble petition of the free Aboriginal inhabitants of Van Diemen's Land who live upon Flinders Island in Bass's Strait, most humbly sure that we, your Majesty's petitioners, are your free children, that we were not taken prisoners, but freely gave up our country to Colonel Arthur, then the Governor, after defending ourselves. Your petitioners humbly state to your Majesty that Mr Robinson made for us and with Colonel Arthur an agreement which we have not lost from our own since, and we have made our part of it good. When we left our own place, we were plenty of people. We are now but a little. This petition of Queen Victoria is made absolutely clear that the people had not forgotten the agreements made by Robinson and Lieutenant Governor Arthur 15 years earlier, and that they had kept their part of their agreement and it was fortified, and it fortified their determination that these agreements should be honoured. The petition was signed by eight men, Walter George Arthur, King Alexander, David Bruni, John Allen, Washington, Frederick, King Tupu, and Augustus. The Crown responded, but not as the people expected. A year later, Wybelena was abandoned and rather than returning to their homelands as promised, the surviving 47 people from Wybelena were relocated to a condemned penal station at Oyster Cove, south of Hobart, a place that was not fit for convicts. So where to from here? This is my history, this is your history, this is Tasmania's history. There is no doubt that a treaty was made in 1831, a treaty that was never rescinded, a treaty that recognised that this island was never terra nullius, a treaty that was never honoured. We can lament, but we cannot change the past. Our lives are intrinsically linked to the past for it shapes the future. Treaty is an important part of Tasmania's unfinished business and a moral imperative. As the next generation of Tasmanian leaders, it is important that each one of you know this history in order to support a treaty dialogue with Tasmanian Aboriginal people and to explore what a 21st century treaty might comprise. I believe we cannot move forward together without knowing and understanding why a chapter of our history continues to cast a shadow over our island state while it remains the unfinished business between successive governments. Only when we collectively have the courage and compassion to reconcile past injustices will we walk together as proud Tasmanians. Thank you. I also uh, wish to acknowledge the Muanina people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land uh, on which the school stands. In fact, the lands from Bridgewater all the way down to uh, below Kingston on this western side of the Derwent River. For me, it's a great tragedy that as a consequence of a combination of violent dispossession and communicable diseases, the Muanina, like so many other of the bands that made up the nations of our Aboriginal people, were obliterated. And so I can't pay my respects to present and emerging elders of the Muanina people. Fortunately for us as a Tasmanian society, a remnant of our Indigenous people survived despite all that they experienced, all of what Aunty Patsy's described so eloquently to us. And that small remnant from the islands in the northeast are, are the ancestors of our current Aboriginal community, which is thriving again in our beautiful state. So 
let me pay my respects, my deep respects to Auntie Patsy as a very important elder in that community and to other uh, current and emerging elders of our Tasmanian Aboriginal community. It's a great privilege to share the podium with Auntie Patsy, to be a white fella, to talk about such an important topic. And uh, I'm really grateful to her and to the school for the privilege of being invited to, to deliver this year's Peter Underwood Lecture jointly with her. It's an honour, of course, also to be invited to deliver the lecture and to talk about such an important topic as a way of honouring the memory of such an important Tasmanian. And I also want to pay my respects to Francis and to the family that are here today, and the family that aren't here today, actually, and we, uh, we know what we mean. So we just reflect for a few minutes on Aunty Patsy's content. George Augustus Robinson, appointed by Governor Arthur as the emissary, made a promise on behalf of the governor to Manalagena and to other elders. And that promise, that promise that if you forego the war in which you are engaged to defend your country and come with us temporarily out to the uh, Bass Strait Islands and to Waibalina, you will be able to return to your ancestral homes. That promise was broken and never honoured. There's a serious question about whether it was ever intended to be honoured but it remains unhonoured to this day. Auntie Patsy is right to remind us of the betrayal and of the fact that this is inescapably part of our state's history and in fact represents a blockage to the flourishing of Tasmania and Tasmanian society. Societies that fail to come to grips with violent pasts that include unresolved and egregious injustice will never flourish to their full potential. And the world is, um, is full of examples of precisely that. Denial, indifference, and societal blindness create a dead weight that persists indefinitely in the absence of change. It's important that I don't underestimate the significance of the Aboriginal Lands Act of 1995, which ceded control over a number of islands and sites of importance to the Tasmanian Aboriginal Lands Council. Nor do I want to underestimate the significance of the then Premier Hodgman's speech in 2015, which he titled Reset the Relationship, which led, uh, amongst other things, to the amendment of the Tasmanian State Constitution to officially recognise our Aboriginal communities as the first peoples of Tasmania. But those gestures are not enough, and there's still some important unfinished work to do. So I'd like to make a few comments about some of the legal aspects of the significance of the, treat, of, of the promise that, that was made, the treaty that was reached, the agreement that was reached in 1831, and what, it might, what effect it might have today. Of course, we could assume that Robinson's promise to Manalagena has no contemporary legal effect. But I want to um, bring your attention to a Supreme Court of Canada, the equivalent of Australia's High Court in the Canadian legal system, where all nine judges unanimously delivered a very important decision in 1990 in a case called the Crown against Sui. I've got a quote from uh, that particular, well, a couple of extracts from the judgment up on the screen. The judges said amongst other things, so, so the facts of the case were that there was an, uh, a, a, a treaty that had persisted, a 1760 treaty, that the Supreme Court of Canada decided still had legal effect in 1990, 230 years after it was reached, after the treaty was agreed. The treaty was an agreement between the uh, colonial authorities of, of Canada and a particular indigenous nation called the Huron people. And that treaty gave to the Huron people the rights of cultural practices to hunt and to fish and to live on Huron land. Huron land uh, subsequently was encroached upon with the declaration of a national park 
and three brothers, three Sui brothers, were persisting with what they believed were their cultural rights to fish and hunt in the national park, even though the regulations pre prohibited such conduct. So the important issue in the case was whether or not the Sui brothers were entitled to do what no white Canadians were able to do, or whether in fact they were bound by the same law. The nine judges of the Canadian Supreme Court said treaties with First Peoples must be given a just, broad and liberal construction with uncertainties resolved in favour of the Indigenous peoples, the Indians. What characterises a treaty, the judges said, is the intention to create obligations, the presence of mutually binding obligations and a certain measure of solemnity. I find that a fascinating decision from 1990 because when we think about what that decision might mean for the agreement here in 1831 that was never honoured, it's not so easy to just dismiss the 1831 agreement and say it can have no legal effect. All of the characteristics that the Supreme Court judges of this case said were important were present in the promise that Robinson made to Manalagena and to others, Togalongata and others. The agreement was never in writing. It was in writing, uh, a record of it was in writing in Robinson's journal, but how would the High Court of Australia, for example, respond to it? Because it was clearly understood by both parties and taken so seriously and in fact acted on by Manalagena and others. Now I'm not trying to suggest that there's an obvious basis for litigation for a court case in Tasmania before the Tasmanian Supreme Court on the basis of the 1831 promise because you need to have what we, would, what we lawyers would like to call a cause of action. There has to be a basis on which you bring the case. And as I explained in relation to the uh, particular 1990 decision in Canada, that was all about prohibition uh, the prohibitions applying to national parks and whether or not Indigenous people were exempted from them. So I think there's some challenges about what it might mean, but I really think it's also important we don't simply write off what was agreed in 1831, so well that happened then, it has no contemporary relevance now. Let's think about why a treaty is important. A treaty between the governing authorities and Indigenous people. And at the federal level, the Commonwealth level, we know that there's no appetite on the part of the Commonwealth Government, so why should we leave it to them? A number of states in Australia are actually taking significant initiatives to negotiate treaties between the state government and the Indigenous peoples of their state. Why is a treaty significant? Why is it important? A treaty is an acknowledgement of the legal status of the other party. That's what's so important here and why Indigenous people gathered at the Uluru Conference back in 2017 pleaded for a treaty, an acknowledgement of the legal status of Australia's Indigenous people. When treaties are negotiated with Indigenous people, the respective government undertaking those negotiations is acknowledging a pre-existing, in our case, pre-colonial sovereignty of First Peoples over their land, and that colonial conquest and the declaration of a legal fiction, in our case, the declaration by the British Crown that the entire continent of Australia was terra nullius, never extinguished the rights of First Peoples. Michael Mansell um, authored a book entitled Treaty and Statehood Aboriginal Self-Determination in 1990 and amongst other things, he says that invasion and occupation may result in temporary deprivation of a people to exercise and enjoy their rights, but invasion and occupation do not and cannot extinguish the rights of the local pop population. Otherwise, Iraqis, Afghanis, Palestinians, the list could go on and on and on, would no longer have rights to their land. Australia is the only Western nation not to have negotiated a treaty or treat multiple treaties with its first peoples. Each of the US, Canada 
and New Zealand have all done that. In fact, Governor Arthur, when he returned, when he was recalled from Van Diemen's Land back to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, or the Colonial Office, I should say, in London in 1836, told the Colonial Office that what had happened in Tasmania, the failure to conclude a treaty here at the start of um, colonial settlement, was a strategic mistake. And that, in fact, it should not be repeated in New Zealand. And as a consequence of Arthur's entreaties to the Colonial Office, Henry Reynolds, our uh, historian that, that uh, Aunty Patsy's already referred to, believes that Arthur was very influential in ensuring that the Treaty of Waitangi was negotiated between the British colonial authorities and the Maori people, Maori people of New Zealand. There are some common fallacies and misunderstandings about treaties with Indigenous people. It's often assumed wrongly that sovereignty within a nation is unitary and can never be divided. The argument runs that Australia enters into treaties with other sovereign nation states, other countries, and can't in enter into a treaty with part of its own population. That assumption is fallacious. It's wrong. In the United States, for example, the Supreme Court Chief Justice Marshall, in the 1831 case of the Cherokee Nation against Georgia, described the Cherokee Nation and other Native American tribes as domestic dependent nations, and that the Cherokee Nation is a dis distinct community occupying its own territory with boundaries accurately described in which the laws of Georgia can have no force and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter but with the assent of the Cherokee themselves or in conformity with treaties and with the acts of Congress. Even US President George Bush, can't believe when I reflect on my views of his administration in the 2000s that now I'm prepared to say publicly seemed like a thoroughly decent principled human being. Hardly a paragon of liberalism, however, but he affirmed in 2001, and the quote's up there, my administration will continue to work with tribal governments on a sovereign to sovereign basis. This is the President of the United States in, maybe in your lifetime, perhaps not actually, 2001's a fair while ago. There are a few adults in the room who were alive at the time, not so long ago, 20 years ago. A President of the United States saying sovereign to sovereign. We will protect and honour tribal sovereignty and help to stimulate economic development in reservation communities. This same attitude that the sovereignty of Indigenous people was not extinguished with colonial invasion, dispossession and subjugation, but must be recognised, acknowledged and affirmed as coexisting with the sovereignty of the state. That is the attitude in the United States, in Canada, and in New Zealand. And it should be the attitude here. There's a second fallacious assumption about sovereignty in Australia and, and recognising sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. And that is that if we do it, I think it's perhaps not just fallacious, but I'd go so far as to describe it as pernicious. If we recognise Aboriginal sovereignty in a treaty, that will result in successful land claims to my backyard and yours, to privately owned land. That's simply not true. It's not true in the United States. It's not true in Canada. It's not true in New Zealand, when the treaties have been negotiated with First Peoples on the basis of pre-existing and then concurrent sovereignty, the sovereignty of the nation state and the coexisting sovereignty of Indigenous peoples with clear delimitation on physical territory. I'm going to finish soon so we can have some questions. I'm sorry. Let me just say a couple of things to finish off. I guess the most important question is after Saturday's election, and we know who the new government is, and I know that Madeline's here, vested interest in the outcome. All of us have a vested interest in the outcome, slightly different vested interests. Congra uh, good luck, Madeline, by the way. Um, 
after Saturday's election, when we know who the new, new government will be, what a wonderful thing it would be if the new government committed itself to a process of negotiation to say publicly that we are prepared to recognise the concurrent sovereignty of Tasmania's Aboriginal people and on the basis of a promise that was dishonoured, that constituted a great deception in the first half of the 19th century, we need to rectify that and we're prepared to sit down in good faith and to discuss how we would do that and then to actually discuss what that treaty would look like. Victoria, Queensland and the Northern Territory are all well advanced on exactly that sort of process. In Victoria, more advanced than any other state on this issue, would say on every issue, but on this issue, uh, they have gone through a process of election of a people's assembly from amongst the designated Aboriginal peoples of Victoria, and that people's assembly is going to be the body that negotiates with the Victorian government a treaty or treaties for the Indigenous people of Victoria. They've just announced, the Victorian government, a few months ago, that they will also establish the equivalent of a royal commission into the telling of the truth about what really happened in the state of Victoria in the colonial invasion and dispossession of Aboriginal land. If they can do it, we can too. And I really hope that I uh, am alive to see us as Tasmanians taking far more seriously the rectification of past wrongs, the acceptance of what occurred, and to truly and fully embrace the riches of Aboriginal culture, language, spirituality, and legal traditions, because then we really will be fulfilled as Tasmanians. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much to both Auntie Patsy and um, Tim. Um, I think I found it quite um, informative. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can work towards a more, um, a future where we can rectify the mistakes of the past. Um, yeah. Yeah, and thank you also for, for cluing us in on what a reconciled future might begin to look like in the near future and reminding us that we reconcile because it's important for us as Tasmanians and as a society to continue to look to. So thank you. Um, so I think there's a little bit of time um, for some questions. If people have them, uh, Riley can do a bit of a run through the crowd. I don't know. Um, is it working? If it works. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions? I can't really see. Can you see? Everyone. I'll start with one. Um, so what do you guys think that a reconciled future will look like in Tasmania? So if we go down this process of, of uh, looking towards a treaty and, and we finish that process with a treaty that everybody's happy with, what do you think that Tasmania would begin to look like post-treaty? Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what would a, a reconciled Tasmania look like? Gosh. So it would be a place where uh, all Tasmanian people would be able to celebrate uh, this uh, amazing deep time history that this country has. I think understanding the, his the history and the culture where everyone will be able to learn about our 
um, amazing, unique history um, so that we would be able to walk together and celebrate that uh, culture and that time. At the moment, because that has not been resolved, that issue of 1831, I believe, uh, has left an indelible mark and I think we need to um, right that injustice. So I see a very just Tasmanian uh, society that will hold its people, its ancient people and its new people and together that we will celebrate um, on this land. And yeah, so it's really to do with bringing about justice and acknowledging and honouring my ancestors because um, that's what's uh, really left um, unresolved as far as I'm concerned. I don't want them to have died in vain. Thank you. Any other questions? Riley, if, if reconciliation was just up to Auntie Patsy and I, we'd have sorted it out years ago. And I would walk with her on the country of her ancestors and not just enjoy, but be thrilled to learn from her about the preciousness of everything she sees. I took her on a road trip once from Hobart to Launceston and all the way up the Midlands, she's talking about that tree and that hill and that mountain. It was fantastic. I do that all the time with her. Oh, money, perhaps not just with her because yeah, I mean, I don't mean any impropriety here. <laughs> she and other, other elders, I, I, I would go and be with them on country and learn as much as I could from them and say that to be fully Tasmanian, I want to embrace 40,000 years at least of continuous cherishing of this place that we all know is a beautiful place. We rave about that. We brag about that. Everywhere we go in the world, what a how lucky we are to live here. But imagine if we didn't just think how lucky we were to live here, how lucky we are to be inheritors of 40,000, 130 generations or more. No, sorry, 1,300, 1,300 generations, maybe 1,500 generations. I consider myself Tasmanian because I'm fifth generation born here. Mate, I mean, that's nothing, is it really? It's nothing compared to 1,300 or 1,400 or whatever the number precisely is. But to say, that's, I, have, I have inherited that magnificent history and culture because we have resolved the injustices of the past and dealt with it openly and honestly and truthfully. And all of us could live together as ancient Tasmanians, as new Tasmanians, proudly without a sense of guilt or shame. That would be a wonderful thing. Thank you, Tim. Other questions? Um, what can we as students do to help contribute to reach the end outcome? Thank you again for that, uh, that question. I, I just think to get yourselves uh, really in, in, embrace the stories and the narratives that I've, I've referred to today, but there are many others, to learn about those, uh, those amazing warriors and those uh, amazing women that uh, put up an amazing fight in Van Diemen's Land. Um, just to become more familiar with that history, to understand that culture, but also perhaps to start dialogue about, well, what would we be able to do to assist Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples and communities in putting forward ideas about what a, uh, and how a, a, treat, a treaty might um, look like, what it might look like. I think um, we, do, we need to do this together and that there has to be understanding, and I think that's where Reconciliation Tasmania, and hello Bill, who's in the audience um, um, today, 
uh, who, who is a, a great um, champion for reconciliation Tasmania. Um, there are lots of ways that you, as young people, can, uh, can lots of ways that you can contribute to us gaining that uh, recognition and to writing a, a very uh, long-standing injustice um, to help investigate those um, uh, those uh, issues of law that are those points of law that Tim has referred to. Um, I think you, you in, in a in a classroom situation could uh, assist in many ways. Um, gosh, Tim. Yes, Annie Patsy. No, I, I think. I don't want to put too much on these young people. No, no, no. I'm happy to. I'm happy to weigh in. I think educating ourselves. We take responsibility to educate ourselves about this, and by that I mean to read. And there are some wonderful books that tell the truth of the history of what happened here. Um, but also to spend a day on country. There are plenty of opportunities for that. Go to Reconciliation Week activities that Reconciliation Taz will be running. Listen to speakers, to Aboriginal speakers, try and meet some, get to know them. There are all sorts of things that we can do to educate ourselves and become much more aware and sensitive. I, I had no idea when I was a child growing up in the northwest coast of Tasmania who the traditional people of the northwest coast were. No idea whatsoever. And I believed all sorts of myths because that's what we were taught. Uh, I, I'm, I feel sad that it's taken me and my sixth decade and uh, I'll, be, I'll come clean slightly into my seventh to, to actually rectify that. But you had the opportunity in um, much earlier in life to get started on educating yourselves and taking it seriously. I just wanted to add to that too, that um, just to be aware that there are a diversity of opinions right across Tasmanian Aboriginal communities, that there's not one community, there are many communities. Uh, just be aware that when you, um, are you going to be doing workshops tomorrow, um, that hopefully you'll have lots of opportunities to see that diversity because it's very rich and, it's, um, and, and we should celebrate diversity amongst Tasmanian Aboriginal communities, I think. Thank you. There was somebody up there. Um, Edith, did you have your hand up? Yeah, we've got time for one more. Um, I know this is so much more than a political issue, but with the election approaching, do you have any political, um, I don't know, favourites of initiatives that are being proposed in the upcoming election? Or noticeable things, relevant? Thanks for the question. I know that Reconciliation Tasmania wrote to the major parties and asked some questions about what their position was or is in relation to some key issues, um, a voice to parliament, truth-telling treaty, but I don't know what the responses are. Bill is the chairman of Reconciliation Tasmania, undoubtedly does. I don't know if he's prepared to declare them or not. Yeah. Drop your right in it. Um, could, could I just add, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not hearing really well. It's really hard for me to hear the questions coming, and I'm so sorry for that. Um, I, I was just going to uh, highlight the task ahead of us for closing the gap uh, with the 16, I think it's 16 um, uh, targets that, are, that, that the Commonwealth have set. And there are, um, you know, it, it, it deals with justice, education, housing, you know, this issue about our young people at the age of 10 being criminalised in the justice system, which we're trying to raise, I suggest that it should be 16. I think at the moment they're looking at raising it to 12. Imagine 12 year olds going into the criminal justice system and then it just becomes a continual circle. So um, there's issues about uh, incarceration of our kids in Tasmania. At, uh, to give you an example, at Ashley, uh, it's between 40 and 60 per cent of the children that go into Ashley are Aboriginal children. It's not acceptable when we're four point something per cent per head of population. 
So there are lots of things that are uh, that we're trying to work through and um, include. And I know that Bill has been as uh, with the reconciliation and with our friend school now working on a reconciliation action plan. I'm sure there'll be lots of wonderful. Uh, uh, things that come out of that development of that plan that will involve how students can contribute to a better Tasmania and a more just and um, fairer Tasmania for Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Yeah, again, thank you guys so much for coming. We really, really appreciate it. I feel like this has been quite informative. Um, and impactful as well. Um, and Riley and I just have a couple of gifts that we would like to give you as well, just for coming today. We'll just end with a quick moment of silence. If our CLEAM students could stay seated, Year 10, if you'd like to depart first. Thank you, everybody.